Welcome. We are so glad that you are with us. We are coming to you live from Champion Church here in Yuma, Arizona. We are at Women's Morning with all the beautiful women of Champion. Let's welcome everyone who's with us today. So glad you are with us. Welcome. Thank you for liking and subscribing if you're watching this on YouTube. It helps the algorithm, helps the message get out. Thank you so much if you're watching this any other place. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your letters and your notes and all the communication. It's truly amazing to know how this just small thing that we do on a weekly basis can reach so far. So whenever you're watching this today, this message goes far past space and time. Wherever you are today, I know it will be a blessing to you. Let's give everybody one more hand clap today. Thank you for being here. We're glad you're here. All right, I want to take you to Psalms 34, 17 through 19 in the NIV, and it says this. The righteous cry out. Are you righteous today? I'm not, but I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. And because I'm covered in the blood of Jesus, and that may seem a little freaky to you, don't worry about it. Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood. And because of that, because he went to the cross and three days later he ascended into heaven, and because of, or he, he uh, arose from the dead three days later, then he ascended into heaven. And the last thing he said to us was this, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. So Jesus is with us right now. So if you are listening today and say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not righteous. All you have to do is one thing. Say, Jesus, I want to give you a chance. Jesus, come into my heart. One of my favorite scriptures, the first scripture I ever learned as a child was in Romans. I stand at the door and knock. And all you have to do is say, come in. I will come into him, it says, into you. And I will be with you. I will sup with you. And I will carry on life with you. How beautiful is that? So today, just say yes to Jesus. He's standing at your door of your heart and knocking. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He hears you today. He delivers you from all your troubles. Say all, all, all your troubles means all of them. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you're brokenhearted today, Jesus is close to you. He will save us and those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles. Come on, somebody, just because you know Jesus doesn't mean you're not going to have troubles. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them from every trouble. He delivers you from them all, all. So today I feel really led to talk to you about mistakes that I have made while trusting God. Maybe you're in a dark time right now, and I want you to learn from some of my mistakes that I have learned. And if you haven't been with me very long, then you do not know that I suffered for five and a half years with an incurable disease. And the only way it could be cured is for it to be cut out of me. And it was ulcerative colitis. And I had it bad. I had an acute attack. I almost died three times. I could not believe when I would wake up that I would still be here. I couldn't believe it. I had to go through an entire surgery where they had to cut me open from sternum down to my pelvis area. I had a bag on my side for nine months. My hair fell out. I had a wig in the closet. I felt pitiful. I felt horrible. I wanted to die several times. There's one specific time where I was really done. I was over. I was out. I was a loser. I couldn't stand myself. I literally hated the very air I was breathing. And that was the day the Holy Spirit showed up in my room. And as I turned my little feeties around and I went to put them in two pink fluffy slippers my husband had bought me, two words came out of my mouth and that was, thank you, Jesus. And it set me free. But there were mistakes that I made. After that surgery, then I had to go in to wait. I had to get he healthy enough, healed enough. And then I had to go in for surgery too, where they took out my intestines, they laid them on a table, they cut them into sixes, and they put them back inside of me. It's called a J-pouch. And if you are a part of that community, which many people follow me now from that community, I love you. Whatever season you're at in your disease, Jesus will make a way for you. But there's mistakes that I made by trusting Jesus. 13 years old, my little sister didn't survive labor. I had to go and pick out her little casket. Come on, you all have had challenges. You've all been through dark times and dark seasons. And there's people today watching who are in dark times and dark seasons. I have a beautiful teenager in this room right now who just went through cancer surgery. Many of you have been through challenges. You've lost ch children. You've lost spouses. You've lost, you've lost, and you've been hurt, and you've been brokenhearted. But Jesus is 
close to you today. And I'm here to remind you that this little preacher girl that you think is so amazing, I wish I could tell you something I'm in the middle of right now, but I can't. I have to tell you when I get through it. But it's like, I got to dress up. I got to show up. And I got to, when my feet hit the floor, the devil has to go, dang it, she's up now. Dang it. She's got out of bed. So I want to talk to you about mistake number one that I made. Number one is this, thinking God was mad at me. Thinking, what did I do to deserve this? The first thing I thought of when I was attacked and I was dying and I didn't know what was going to happen. And we're pastoring Faith Christian Center. And I've loved Jesus for mostly all of my life since five years old up. Did I live a perfect life? No. But I love Jesus. I tried to serve him. I traveled around with my puppets. I was leading children's ministry. The minute my husband took over as senior pastor, we were learning and growing. I had two little boys at home. And now I'm suffering and dying. And I kept laying there saying to myself, what have I done to deserve this? What did I I do God why are you so mad at me what are you trying to teach me and the word of God really took me to Genesis 50, 50 20 and Joseph said this to his brothers after they had did all that they could to destroy him kill him throw him in his cistern sell him off to another country when he finally realizes his brothers his enemies the people who were against him were standing in front of him this is what he says to them in Genesis 50 20 you intended to harm me but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. God does not do to you, but he will use that thing within you to do something amazing. God is a turnaround God. He is not a turn on you, God, but he is a turn around God. When you ever feel that God has turned on you, you just say, no, I'm in a turnaround. I always say this, nothing falls apart. It falls together. You may think it's falling apart, but if you love Jesus and you're righteous because of the cross, you can say, it is not falling apart, it is falling together. God is going to do something through this. I don't know what, but it's going to be something amazing in the end when I look back. God will turn it around. He will not turn on you. Psalms 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength and an ever-present help in times of trouble. Learn from his word, his nature, and his character, girls. When you feel God has turned his back on you, he's mad at you, and he's coming against you, always remember the scriptures and the character of God and who he is. Not your earthly father who may have taught you. You are a naughty little girl. You have no perfection that's good enough for me. You may have had a dad who left you and stomped out on you. And so often we will relate our feelings of our earthly father onto our heavenly father because we're not in his word, knowing his character and knowing who he is and how he wants to bless you. James 1.17 says this, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father. I was laying in my hospital bed at one point and I was really sad. I just felt like, how can God be doing this? I don't even understand. And I, this was when they couldn't find a bed for me. And finally they ended up after putting me in an induced coma to try to settle me down. They found a bed for me in the geriatric, geriatric ward. So there I was in the geriatric ward. There were people dying around me. There's a lot of chaos because people are in their older age and it was very difficult and I felt sorry for myself. By this time my hair started to fall out. So all I could get is this little bun on the top of my head because when you're so malnutrition the first thing your body wants to do quit growing hair quit having monthly cycles like it just it does everything it possibly can to try to survive so it lets go of stuff and one of the things that let go on me was my hair and I woke up one day my hair was everywhere I was scra my face was itchy and I realized wow your hair like grows out like all at once it like grows out so I had this little tiny fuzzy thing on the top of my head and I felt so sorry for myself I was just and I and then they said Listen, Dad, they called me Lucy because I had like a reddish tint to my hair at the time. And I had this little fuzzy ball on my head and they would see me crying. So they started calling me Lucy. They said, Lucy, they did. They said, Lucy, you have a phone call. I said, I do have a phone call. Well, I 
didn't get sick in America, you all. I didn't have a matching bedspread with matching curtains, a little phone by my bed, and a little TV clicker. I didn't get that. No, I was in socialized medicine. I had a cement floor at St. Paul's Hospital with a nice bed and a little metal thing on the side and a little, you know, tray here. That was it. That was it. That's all you got. So I, at this point, I was at uh, Surrey Memorial. And same thing. It's all the same. I think they had tiles on this floor. So I, I walked over. I got the phone. I reached over. I took the phone. I'm like, hello. And it was Cindy. This is Judy. Mama Judy. She was my youth pastor growing up. She was my God mama. She loved Jesus. Some of you might remember Judy McKern being here. She's an amazing little spitfire for Jesus. She said, God told me to call you and tell you he didn't do this to you. This isn't God. This isn't how Jesus works, Cindy. This is the devil. You just keep standing in faith. And don't you? And she just read me the rights. And I was like, I can't believe you would call me right now. I was just praying, saying to God, what did I do to deserve this? And she said, you didn't do anything to deserve this. This is the work of the enemy. You just stay strong, Cindy, and know that God is working on your behalf. And today I come to tell you, God has not done what you are going through to hurt you, harm you, or cause you pain. He is right there in the middle of it, working his plan out for you. Don't be like me and waste your precious little time saying, God, how did you do this to me? Stop doing the why and start asking God, what? What's next? How do we get out of this? How do we get through this? What's next for my life? I speak that over you now, a what next attitude, because let me tell you something. God is here today to let you learn something from the mistakes that I made while I was trusting him in the darkest of dark times. Number two, caring what people thought about me when my life wasn't perfect. The first thing I thought of is, what is everybody going to think? I've been diagnosed. I've been hurt. I'm in the hospital. I'm in the hospital another week and another week and another week. And Dr. Press, this amazing woman who was just given her life to fight the disease of, of internal things, she would come and look at my chart. Mm. Next night, mm. Next night, mmm. Next night, mmm. She'd look at my chart, mmm. That's, that's all I would get out of her is mmm. That wasn't good news. Until she finally said, mmm. You know what? You're not really doing that emotionally very good right now, so I'm going to send you home for a, a weekend. So she sends me home for a weekend. That was one of the only pauses she did out of her mmm. 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 It's kind of a rough go, right? And I kept thinking to myself, what's going to happen? I'm in, this is a pastor's wife, a Faith Christian Center in Canada. The only reason why we named our church Faith Christian Center was because Pastor Stephen's father's church was Faith Tabernacle. And Faith Tabernacle was, didn't sound very cool in the early, late, eight, late 80s, early 2000s. It sounded weird. So we put, we put Faith Christian Center out because Christian Center was super popular. We got so much hate mail because we were called a faith church. Nobody showed up to our church. Nobody knew we were balanced. Nobody knew the pastor's wife of a faith church is dying in the hospital or we wouldn't have got their crappy letters about being a faith church. We might have gotten a letter with, hey, we're praying for you guys. But see, that's how the enemy works. And then he makes you think, oh my gosh, everybody thinks bad things about me. I wish I could have given a flipping care less about what people thought about me. Can you be set free today about what people think about your divorce, somebody leaving you, your child getting on the bandwagon and do something crazy, whatever it is that you're facing today, can I say and let go to you? Who cares what people think? You got to care about what God thinks, not about what people think about you in the times. Daniel didn't care what people thought when they stuck him in the diet and the lions didn't because you know what? He knew my God is going to show up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't care when they got thrown in the fire because they knew a fourth man was going to stand there with them. Ruth didn't care when her husband died. She said, I'm going with you, Naomi, to the land of your people because wherever you go, there I will go, regardless of what man has died in my life. Deborah didn't care when she had to go out and fight the army. Here she is, a woman of God, and she has to go now and fight 
in an army. They got jailed, took a pig, a, a pig and went through the head of that crazy person. But that's not what I'm speaking about today. <laughs> Esther didn't care. When Haman turned on her and wanted to kill her and all of her people, she didn't worry about what anybody thinks of her. She said, if I die, then I die. We're going to fast and we're going to pray and we're going to see the salvation of the Lord. Please, beautiful one, be set free today about what people think, what people are talking about you. Good Lord, I had to learn as a pastor's wife young, and I thank God for Norman Vincent Peale. You probably don't even know who he is. If you are a pastor's wife, you need to Google some of his stuff from years and years and years ago. Norman Vincent Peale, I'll never forget being a new pastor's wife. I cracked open one of his books and it said... If you are being criticized, if people are gossiping about you, if people are talking about you, you are nothing more than a red balloon. Because red balloons that go up high give everybody a chance to look at you. Thank God you have some helium and you're red and you're floating above the crowd because when you float above the crowd, people are going to point at you. They're going to see you. They're going to pick on you. Some people are going to love red balloons and some people are going to hate red balloons. Some people are going to rejoice over red balloons and some people are going to curse red balloons. Who cares? At least you're strong enough to rise up above the crowd and be somebody strong enough to be pointed at. Some of y'all need to know that God has a plan for you to rise up above your circumstance and your situation. Galatians 1.10. I am now trying to win the approval. I am now, I am now trying to win the approval of human beings. Or am I trying to win the approval of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I got to read that to you all again. Galatians 1.10. Come on, some of y'all, pastors, wives, watch me from all over. Y'all need to hear this one more time, beautiful girls. Because I've been young. I know I talked to a, a girl just the other day and what she's going through with people in her church. Good Lord. And she was telling me the same thing they all say. Everybody hates each other when they attend our church. But when they leave, they all are like little magnets to each other. And they all get together. And now you're their big reason for living. And nah, 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 and I said, sweetheart, welcome to the ministry. And you got to get to the point where you could care flipping less. And you just keep doing what Jesus has asked you and called you to do. And I'm just like, woo, up here right now. Okay, Galatians 1.10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people... I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. God, help me, Jesus, to always be only concerned about what you, my husband, thinks, and the people that you have graced me to serve. I want to serve them well. Everybody else can go to happy places <laughs> that they consider happy. Proverbs 29 5 says the fear of man will prove to be a snare but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe you trust in the Lord you let people ah, their approval what does it matter what does it matter in the light of heaven who cares who saw me sick it's who sees me well now because my God showed up for me he showed up for me in the fiery furnace. He showed up for me in the lion's den. He showed up for me in the middle of the battle, somebody. He showed up for me when I didn't care. If I die, then I'm just going to die. But I'm going to trust you, Jesus. One night I went to sleep and there was a picture. I love the picture I have of Jesus in my boys' rooms. I had different pictures. And the one is the scripture I started out with. And it's Jesus knocking on the door. And there's no handle on the door because only you can open it from the inside and let Jesus in. And Jesus is standing there and he's knocking on the door and I looked up at that and I knew Jesus was in my heart and I said Jesus I am so sick right now if you take me to heaven take me to heaven but if I live help me God get through this and when I woke up the next morning I was like I'm still here because my guts were rotten they felt like they were just so rotten so today we are going to live for Jesus girls not people number three I underestimated the power of my faith 
But girls, once I got a hold of the fact that God was not mad at me, once I got a hold of the fact that God was a good God. Once I got a hold of the fact that I could declare his promises and I got out of the Pentecostal mindset and I love Pentecostal people, but back in my day, in my day, the way I was raised in the Pentecostal mindset was that if you was a naughty person when Jesus came back and in the rapture, if you were in looking at a naughty movie, if you were out doing something bad with your friends, you were out drinking and partying, guess what? You weren't going to be in the rapture because that meant you were a naughty person person and you were doing something wrong and I had this feeling that I was doing something wrong and that I was a bad girl but when I understood that God's goodness is what brings man to repentance and I realized it's the goodness of God no longer was I trying to perform for Jesus I was declaring back to him the promises that he had given me to stand on during my season of hardship heart heart broken hearts hardships hard times. The more awful it gets, the louder you need to get. J. Iris came to Jesus, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. And Jesus just simply looked at him and he said, don't stop believing. I still have some things to do before I get there. But Jesus, she's not. you've got to just believe God no matter what the circumstance has been told to you. You still believe. You still have a right to believe. You still have a choice to believe in your heart what God is going to do. Don't succumb to the answer in the very beginning. If I would have done that, I would have had to have have an apparatus on the outside of my body for the rest of my life because I was told this is just how it's going to be. But when God got involved in this situation and I find myself down in a specialist's office downtown Vancouver in a place I never dreamt I would have been 24 hours before, there I was. I saw the plan of God for my life. And that's how God works. You can declare the promises of God. Someone drove me from Seattle to Vancouver, British Columbia, a little book called By His 39 Stripes You're Healed. They don't even print it anymore. It's this little tiny orange book. And you insert your name and you begin to pr- say these promises over your life. I'm getting ready to write my own promise book because I'm telling you what, I know what needs to go in that promise book. Probably some things I didn't even have in that promise book. There's some ways you can begin to declare in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord over your life, over your circumstance, over your challenge, over whatever it is that you're facing today. James 1, 6 says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. You don't want to be two-sided. You want to know that you know that you have a promise from God. I will pick up my mat and I will walk and I will declare the goodness of God over my life. For the sake of time, I'm going to keep going. Number four, I was shocked how God used me through the dark times. I was shocked that God would use me. We often quit believing when it sounds like it's too late. It's over. Don't give up just because it sounds like it's over. What voice will you listen to when the bottom falls out? And here we are at the very first scripture that we started with. Psalms 34, 17. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many, many troubles, but the Lord, most beautiful person, the Lord will deliver you from them all. That's right, I know. I met somebody who said, I just want you to know that so-and-so in my life is going through severe chemo right now and they lay on the couch and they watch your shows and they feel so empowered and strengthened by you. Beautiful person today, I want you to know the Lord, if you're watching today, the Lord is close to you. He hears you, he sees you, he knows what you're going through. And the thing I can tell you is this, in this time when I was shocked how God used me through dark times and I would just trust Jesus, I would just give get up in faith and do something. I would write letters, even though I couldn't go and do something. I would write letters and give them to people to mail them for me. I would call people if I was close to a phone that was attached to a wall. We didn't have cell phones back then. There was no texting. I would call people. I would reach out to people. I would walk around the hospital. I would pray for people. In fact, I remember one time somebody came up to me and said, here is a bunch of quarters because I know I've been seeing you by the phone and you've been paying for people's phone calls and I have all these quarters left out and I'm getting 
getting ready to be to be released from the hospital. I want to give them to you so you can make sure people can make their phone calls. That's the kind of person you can become a little evangelist in your hospital. You can become an evangelist like our Leslie showing up at the chemo center here in Yuma, Arizona, giving everybody breakfast burritos because that's what God blessed her to do. You can be used wherever you are. Some of us are so stuffed and so full and we're just walking around like this, so full of Jesus, so full of another class, of another service, of another bless me, of another la 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 hallelujah. We, we, we need to get squished and get some Jesus out of you. Y'all need to be serving, loving, doing, being part of. Thank you to all of you who made a most amazing youth conference because of you. It was an incredible thing. You came and you gave out of yourselves and you came out of who you are and you did something ble- amazing to bless your Savior. The last one is realizing, uh, two minutes, realizing God cares about the physical, not just the spiritual girls. He cares about your physical body. He cares about the food in your cu- in your cabinets. He feels, he, he cares about your gas tanks. He cares about the physical as much as the spiritual. You have every right to believe God for prosperity and blessing. You have every right to believe God for your children, for things that are of the physical world as much as the spiritual world. It's not just all about your soul going to heaven. It's about your soul here on earth and how you're full of Jesus and how you have something beautiful to give out today. Matthew 6, 25 and 26 says, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food, the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than that? You're valuable to Jesus today. Your life is valuable to him and he loves you and he wants to fill you up like never before. He wants to walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death where you fear no evil, where you know that his rod and his staff are comforting you. You know his character. You know his unconditional love for you. You know that he's on your side fighting for you. You know that he sees every enemy and everything that comes against you and yet your savior is making a way where there seems to be no way. It says that our steps are ordered by the Lord, which means we have to still take steps. Don't just stay frozen. Don't just, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Take a step. God's going to show you what to do. He's going to show you who to call. He's going to show you what to eat. He's going to show you where to go. He cares about everything. Body, soul, and spirit. He cares about your heart today being whole. He cares about when it's broken. He cares about whatever it is you're facing. Every tear that drops, I'm running out of time. I want to be with you. I want to stay with you. I want to love on you. I want to thank you today for watching. I want to let you know that we love you. We pray for you. We hold you up to Jesus. I hold you up to our Savior now. In the mighty name of Jesus, be blessed. We love you so much. Let's give everybody a hand clap.